Chapter 5 Hijra, the Migration. Despite all the opposition and the plots against him, Muhammad continued to preach. He spent most of his time preaching outside the city in the valleys and the settlements outside uh, Mecca, at a place called Aqaba between Mount Hira and Mina, a few miles from ne Mecca. And he met and preached to a group of six men from the northern city of Yathrib, who had come to attend the annual pilgrimage and fair that was part of the ritual year in Mecca. They listened earnestly to Muhammad's words. The meeting ended with their conversion and an accord. The men would take the message of Islam back to their city and return the following year. Muhammad sent some of his followers to Yathrib to read the Quran and instruct them in the religion. The next year a bigger delegation arrived, some 73 men and two women, to meet with Muhammad at Aqaba. The meeting led to the second covenant of Aqaba, in which the visitors agreed to protect Muhammad as they would protect their own women and children. On this occasion, an entire tribe from Medina, Banu Abd al-Ashal, converted to Islam. They invited Muhammad to come and join them in Yathrib. This was a new kind of alliance, an accord based not on family, clan or any tribal allegiances. It was based on faith. It didn't take the Quraysh long to discover that Muhammad had made an alliance with some tribes of Yathrib. They regarded it as an attempt to wage war against them. The tensions between Muhammad and his enemies in Mecca had reached boiling point. The Quraysh devoted considerable time to think how they could outmaneuver Muhammad and destroy his faith. Ultimately, they decided to kill the Prophet. Their plan was both simple and ingenious. One member of every clan in Mecca would stab Muhammad, all at the same time, making it impossible for Muhammad's own clan to avenge his murder. On the appointed night, the settled group surrounded Muhammad's house. They were assured of Muhammad's presence when they spotted a sleeping figure wrapped in something that he wrapped himself round with normally, which was a green cloak. They did not enter in deference to Arab notions of chivalry because they were aware that there were women in the house. At dawn, with daggers drawn, the assassins rushed into Muhammad's house. But instead of finding the Prophet, they found his young cousin Ali sleeping in his bed. Muhammad came to know of the plot and had slipped out unnoticed during the night. And then he met up with his friend and companion Abu Bakr. And together they set off to the journey of Yathrib. The young men of the Quraysh chose to kill Muhammad were enraged. They organised an armed party and set out in pursuit to hunt him down. Muhammad and Abu Bakr had decided to hide in the cave of Thawar. It was to the south of Mecca, in exactly the opposite direction to the nor normal route. This was kept well guarded and secret, yet the search party managed to trace their steps up to the foothill of Mount Thawar. I'm going to say, it spells it differently. First, um, okay. I'm moaning. Okay. From where the trial ran cold and the trackers were brought to a standstill. They searched for three days but could find no trace of Muhammad or his footprints. Eventually, they gave up and returned to Mecca. Let me get back to it. It says Mount Thawar. Thawar is spelled T-H-A-W-R in one section and then another T-H-W-A-R. So they switched the W and A around. Anyway, never mind. All this jiggery pokery of the translations. Okay. When the coast was clear, Muhammad and Abu Bakr continued their journey to Yathrib. As did they not take the usual caravan route, but kept to the desert. Their journey was exceptionally hard. There was nothing to alleviate the remorseless sun, nor was there any water to quench their thirst. They travelled for seven days hiding from the heat of the sun and potential threats during the day and moved swiftly at night. 
Muhammad's followers, the entire Muslim community, had already slowly and systematically slipped out of Mecca and made their way to Yathrib. But back in Mecca, Ali was returning the deposit and trust that the Meccans had kept with Muhammad and was repaying his loans or returning other things he had borrowed. Muhammad received a rapturous reception in Medina, which is the same as Yathrib. In his honour, the name of the city was later changed. Ah, there we go. Forever after Yathrib would be known as Medina Medina Tul Nabi, the city of the Prophet. Usually short and simply to Medina. There's a subsection here. Islamic calendar. The Prophet's migration from Mecca to Medina, known as the Hijrah, took place in 622 of the Common Era. It marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar. It's a lunar calendar consisting of 12 lunar months, which are not synchronised with the seasons. It drifts by 10 or 11 days a year. And the seasonal relation repeats about every 33 lunar, cal uh, lunar years. The dates are given as A.H. Ano Hijri, Hijra or after Hijra. His life as a prophet in Mecca had been akin to being in crucible, relentless persecution, constant threats to his life, continuous oppression of his followers, and full of personal loss and tragedies. Yet he endured all this with patience and good humour and was ever ready to forgive his tormentors. Even his sworn enemies had complete trust in him and respected his integrity, humility, kindness and compassion. Muhammad went out of his way to avoid direct confrontation with the Quraysh. And when faced with violence, always chose a non-violent way out of his predicament. The Muslim community in Mecca was small, with fewer than 300 people. Life had been hard and it was not possible to keep records. This is why the Meccan period of Muhammad's life is not well documented as it should be. The revelations of this period, which constituted about two-thirds of the Quran, also have a distinctive character. They tend to be short, emphasising the spiritual aspects of life and dwell on the source and origins of Muhammad's mission. His mission, the, the, the revelation states, is only to teach the essence of faith. He is told that the message itself is not new, but a continuation of the message sent to all the previous prophets. We have sent revelations to you, prophet, as we did to Noah and the prophets after him, to Abraham, to Ishmael, to Isaac, to Jacob and the tribes, to Jesus, to Job, to Jonah, to Aaron and Sol Solomon. To David, we gave the book, the Psalms, to other messengers we have already men mentioned to you and also to some we haven't. Chapter 4 verse 163 The Meccan chapter contain no legislative commandments. They exhort, guide and advise. The situation of Muslims changed significantly with the migration to Medina. In addition to the Muslims who came from Mecca, known as Muhajir, immigrants or refugees, there were mass conversions among the Ansar, the helpers and supporters. The people of Medina who invited him to the city. The Muslim community was still relatively small. It doubled in size, some accounts say, were 150 Muhajirs and 50 Ansar. But Muhammad was largely among his followers and the Muslims had a sense of autonomy. Muhammad could now devote some of his time to building a just and equitable community. Thus, as the emphasis of his life changed, so did the tone and character of the revelations, which now had a legislative spin, though the Quran had fewer prescriptive injunctions than one might expect, it describes itself as a book of guidance rather than a book of law. The various nobles of Medina vied for with each other to invite Muhammad to stay in their house, but he refused. It was a delicate matter and of no small political import. Rather than opt for a particular location, he decided to settle where his camel came to halt. It was a piece of land 
belonging to two orphan brothers. He was offered the land as a gift but again declined and insisted that its owners should be paid adequately. He ordered that a mosque should be built on the land. The whole Muslim community, including Muhammad himself, joined in building the mosque. As they built the mosque, Muhammad sang, There is no life but the life of the next world. O oh God, have mercy on the muhajir, uh, of the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Ali, his cousin, joined him with his own poem. There is one that labours night and day to build us mosque of brick and clay and one who turns from dust away. The mosque came to be known as a prophet's mosque, and Muhammad also built a small house besides it. He declared that all Muslims were brothers and paired each muhajir with an Ansar brother, an act that raised the prestige of the locals and ensured the material welfare of the immigrants. The Ansar invited the muhajir into the house. I'm going to start using English terms. The migrant Muslims from Mecca into the house and opened their purse string to them. Initially, the migrants accepted, the Meccan migrants accepted their hospitality with joy. But they did not want to be burdened to the brothers in Medina. The traders among them quickly established themselves and were able to make a substantial living. Those who could not engage in trade took to farming and land owned by the, what's called, the native Ansar under the system of sharecropping. The arrangements not only provided for mutual assistance between the two groups, they also established the bonds of real fraternity. The Muslims were now forged into a strong, indivisible community. During this initial period in Medina, Muhammad also established a call to prayer, the Azan, which throughout the Muslim world summons the faithful to prayer for the Sunnis five times a day. As Bilal, the slave who was tortured in Mecca, had the utmost beautiful voice and he was asked to make the first call to prayer. Other religious institutions such as the obligatory poor tax, zakah, the fasting during the month of Ramadan were also established. The Azan translated into English. God is great, God is great. I witness that there is no God but the God. I witness that Muhammad is the prophet of God. Rise to prayer, rise to felicity. God is great, God is great. There is no God but God. Muhammad asked his followers to show kindness and mercy to others. Avoid pride and haughtiness. Be just and modest in all matters. And pay attention to personal, personal hygiene. As for himself, he led a rather aesthetic life. Shunning all extravagance and luxuries. In Mecca, the Quraysh were seething with anger. They had managed to throw Muhammad out of the city of his birth, where he grew up, met and married and beloved, his beloved Khadija, and where he had his first experience of revelation. But in Medina, Muhammad presented an even bigger threat to their power and privilege because he could now preach freely and spread his message more widely than ever before. The Meccans became more determined to crush Muhammad and exterminate the nascent Muslim community. Oh, finish this one. It's quite short.